Peruvian Nobel Prize winning novelist Mario Vargas Llosa is nothing if not prolific. From his debut novel, The Time of the Hero, published in 1963, to Harsh Times in 2019, he has put out almost 20 novels, few of which could exactly be described as slight, and many of which are ambitious, complex, and substantial. At the same time, Vargas Llosa has also written short stories, memoirs, plays, almost a dozen, book-length works of literary criticism on writers from the 19th century Frenchman Gustave Flaubert and Victor Hugo, to his own Latin American contemporaries José María Guedas and Gabriel García Márquez, at least one government-sponsored official report into a massacre during Peru's civil war, some poetry, as well as innumerable essays, articles that have appeared in newspapers from Lima to Tokyo, Cape Town to Seattle, and all points in between, commentaries, manifestos, reviews, forewords, epilogues, speeches, and so on. Along the way, he somehow made time to run, in 1990, for the Peruvian presidency. In addition to his many other awards and decorations, from honorary doctorates at Harvard and Yale, to a hereditary peerage from the King of Spain, and most recently, as the first non-Francophone writer to be elected to the Académie Française, he can surely bid for the title of most industrious writer in Latin American literature. What is more, Vargas Llosa's fictional output is notable for its variety of settings, themes, styles, and tones. He has set novels in all parts of Peru's diverse landscape, the coast, the mountains, and the rainforest, as well as in Brazil, the Dominican Republic, the South Pacific, Ireland and Central Africa, and elsewhere. They depict topics from bullying and social discrimination among schoolboys, to 19th century millenarian religious movements, to a murder mystery in the desert, and another in the Andes, to Vargas Llosa's own first marriage with his aunt, more precisely his uncle's sister-in-law. They're frequently experimental in style, employing, for instance, fractured narratives with multiple points of view. Though despite this, they are seldom as difficult, not to say impenetrable, as the work of some of his peers. For all his patrician auteur, there's always a populist streak in Vargas Llosa's prose. And they range from historical epic to social critique, erotica to political thriller, melodrama to something like tragedy. But almost never are they trivial. Perhaps what unites them, or many of them at least, is an attempt at diagnosis, or even autopsy, to answer the question of what went wrong. One instance of this impulse is the famous semi-rhetorical question at the outset of the monumental conversation in the cathedral. At what precise moment had Peru fucked itself up? In Vargas Llosa's world, something is almost always fucked up. A death, a massacre, a marriage, a disappearance. It is up to him, or his characters, to find out why and how. Captain Pantoja and the Special Service, originally Pantaleon y las Visitadoras, the Spanish title literally means Pantaleon and the Visitors, with the implication that it deals with official visitors, such as travelling inspectors, was Vargas Llosa's first comic novel. Its protagonist, the titular Captain Pantaleon Pantoja, is a Peruvian army quartermaster, sent on a mission to tackle the dissolute behavior of army personnel stationed in the country's Amazon region. Isolated, far from their wives and girlfriends, 
and supposedly fired up by the region's climate and food. The warm humidity, that excess of nature. Soldiers have taken to harassing, even raping local women, stirring up anger and indignation among the populace. Pantoja's task then is to establish a clandestine special service of army funded prostitutes who will travel from base to base providing a tacitly approved, but officially denied, outlet for the recruits' sexual desires. Pantoja, selected for the task because he's both a man without vices and a miracle of organization, immerses himself in this duty wholeheartedly, too much so for his long-suffering wife, assembling a roving squadron of sex workers that is the very model of efficiency, with every visit calculated and calibrated to the tiniest detail. The cure, however, is worse than the so-called disease. Demand for these special services is inexhaustible and becomes a matter of public scandal when one of the prostitutes, Pantoja's favorite, and his personal mistress, because, in the end, even he cannot resist, is killed in a confrontation with civilians who want in on the action. With the secret exposed, the operation is dismantled, and Pantoja is sent to a new posting in the frigid Altiplano, close to the Bolivian border at almost 4,000 meters above sea level, far from the libidinous Amazon. The book's comedy comes from an incongruity of tone and theme. Matters that are usually seen as playful or spontaneous – seduction, desire – are treated with great formality and subject to rigorous regulation. Bureaucratic rationality is obsessed with imposing order on wayward concup concupiscence. But this obsession becomes ludicrous, literally play-like. And the second step of the joke is that order gives rise to a chaos of its own, as the special service threatens to soak up all the army's resources, literalizing the slogan, make love, not war. The novel's danger, however, is that in what critic Michael Wood calls its brilliant assault on seriousness. It fails to take account of the fact that army bureaucrats, fanatically following orders, are not always funny, and that in the early 1970s, elsewhere in Latin America, other clandestine military units were generating a rather less comic anarchy, always in the name of order and progress. It is not easy to write or even talk about humour. Just as a joke that requires explanation is not much of a joke, so explanations in general tend to annul what makes jokes funny. Similarly, it is hard to convince someone else that something is amusing. They either share your sense of humour or not, and if not, there is little to be done about it. Still, it is worth persevering and asking what makes us laugh or not, even at the risk that we miss something essential through analysis, or that we are accused of taking a joke too seriously. After all, in Captain Pantoja, taking things too seriously is part of the point and butt of much of the comedy. 
But how does this happen? What techniques does Vargas Llosa employ to make us laugh? Do they work for you or not? What kind of humor is this? Have a think. Put some ideas down in your notebook. While you do that, I'll have a beer. But I'll be right back. We may sometimes think that the pleasure of a joke comes from the fact that we're able to express something that is otherwise taboo or unmentionable. To put this another way, jokes provide cover for saying what otherwise should not be said, and our laughter comes from the shock of saying the unsayable. The seriousness of what is said can then be diluted with the excuse that we are only joking, that because it is said jokingly does not have the same force as if it were said straight. Jokes, in short, allow for the release of inhibitions, and their pleasure comes from the fact that, as Sigmund Freud puts it, at least momentarily, we do not have to expend the psychical energy required to maintain the inhibition. In Freud's rather technical words, the hearer of the joke laughs with the quota of psychical energy which has become free through the lifting of the inhibitory cathe cathexis. We might say that he laughs this quota off. More simply, any time we are able to let our guard down, however briefly, the release of the energy that would otherwise be spent in keeping our guard up is felt as pleasurable. Again, we can also see this the other way around. In jokes, we can briefly evade the censorship or repression, psychic, but also perhaps political, that normally regulates what can and cannot be expressed. Like dreams, then, for Freud, jokes offer a pathway to understanding the workings of the unconscious. They also return us, again briefly, to a state of childish play, in which anything still goes, and before the adult demands of seriousness and decorum take hold. Play, for Freud, is the first stage of jokes, but it is brought to an end by the strengthening of a factor that deserves to be described as the critical fac faculty or reasonableness. Humor reactivates that sense of play that we have otherwise lost, or rather repressed through reason or reasonableness. Captain Pantoja, however, does not quite follow this model. It makes fun of seriousness through seriousness by taking formality to an extreme. It is not so much that it lifts repression as that it redoubles that repression via a bureaucratic use of euphemism that strains language to its limit. So the sexual act is redescribed as a service. In the original Spanish, the term used Prestación, meaning benefit or provision, is even more forced, while prostitutes become visitors. Again, the Spanish visitadoras is so stilted as to be practically archaic, and so on. In Pantojas and Vargas Llosa's hands, the language of bureaucratic order, or rational calculation, becomes delirious feverish. In short, it is not just the male libido that supposedly gets out of hand in the tropics. The forces intended to contain, as Michael Wood notes in both senses of that word, restrict 
and subsume that libido are contaminated with the same mania that they set out to combat. We laugh because we sense the pointlessness of repression when it has to go to such lengths and only draws attention to its artificiality. Something will always escape. At the risk of being accused of being a killjoy, but feminist Sarah Ahmed's Killjoy Manifesto dares us to take that risk, it is worth taking a step back from this laughter to ask what else we end up laughing at. Critic Sara Castro Claren, for instance, argues persuasively that as well as laughing at his bureaucratic zeal, at the same time we end up laughing at Pantoja because he does not know how to behave like a true macho, unlike his superiors who, at the end of the novel, revert to the status quo ante of keeping a prostitute as a sexual respite on the side. General Scavino unbuttons his fly. We laugh, Castro Claren argues, from a machista perspective. Moreover, in addition, we find ourselves laughing from the centre at the periphery, from the viewpoint of the educated white upper classes mocking the impressionable cholos, recently westernised indigenous people, or wachafos, the lower class on its way up, for their naive faith either in the forces of modernity, Pantoja, or in the millenarian cult that the novel portrays also to be sweeping the Amazon, a cult that finally puts paid to Pantoja's project. In Castro Claren's words, Pantaleon y las visitadoras satirizes the mental patterns of one social class, Cholos, from the point of view of another, central power. The view is indeed from above. The cosmopolitan reader amuses himself with the uncritical melodrama and with the myopia of the wachafitos who aspire to tame a wild country. Not that the top brass are spared either, though here the point of view assumed is more international than national. The satire from above presupposes an observer who sits one notch up from Lima in the class and power hierarchy, and whose natural response, in view of the blunders of the Wachafo modernizing military, is amused laughter. We laugh at the over-serious Pantoja, at his anxious and scandalized family, at the prostitutes he recruits, at the alternately outraged and envious civilians looking on, at the military officers who have cooked up this entire plan, and so on and so forth, all from the privileged space of some elsewhere that is certainly not Iquitos, and perhaps not even Peru. By the time of the novel's publication in 1973, Vargas had been almost entirely living outside of the country, in Barcelona, Paris, London and elsewhere, for well over a decade, since 1959. He would not reinstall himself in Peru until 1974. Today he's a Spanish citizen and hereditary Marquez, based mostly in Madrid. At the same time, there is surely more than a little of the exceptional indus exceptionally industrious Mario Vargas Llosa in his creation, Captain Pantaleon Pantoja. Pantoja is, after all, also a writer, as his voluminous memoranda to his superiors attest. His mania parallels that of an author, himself famous, as critic Wolfgang Luchting puts it, for his organization, his extraordinary diligence, perseverance, his legendary dedication. Hence, Pantaleon Pantoja is one of the manifestations of Vargas Llosa himself, 
just as Madame Bovary is Gustave Flaubert. What is more, Pantoja's drive to organize everything, from food to sex, is not so far removed from Vargas Llosa's off-stated and equally unachievable ambition to write a total novel. No author can achieve this, because their book would never end, unless it is stopped short at some given point, arbitrarily. Similarly, then, there is nothing intrinsic to the organizing principle that will bring it to its conclusion. Pantaleon still hopes to expand the scope of his squadron services to the civilian population, even after the scandal has been exposed. There is a megalomania in authorship and in bureaucracy alike. After a decade of high seriousness, Vagasiosa is also laughing at himself. Another aspect to this book should be noted. Few critics have made much of the context of the novel's publication. But by 1973, Peru had been governed for half a decade by a military dictatorship under the command of General Juan Velasco Alvarado, who had taken power in a bloodless coup in October 1968. This Peruvian dictatorship was decidedly anomalous. Its leaders were modernizers and progressives, who sought to side with the poor and bring a measure of justice to rural indigenous communities. They restructured the educational system, introduced bilingual education in Spanish and Quechua, and most significantly, implemented South America's most far-reaching program of land reform, seeking to reduce the power of large landowners, expropriating haciendas, and promoting agricultural cooperatives. Ultimately, however, they were caught in a contradiction. As José Miguel Oviedo puts it, the revolutionary rhetoric of the military regime proposed no less a contradiction than that which destroyed Pantaleon. The libertarian and humanistic socialism which these military men aspired to develop in Peru would be possible only if they, as a class or professional caste, disappeared. Though set in the 1950s, then, Vargas Llosa's novel, which he researched on visits to the country in 1971 and 1972, it is much about Peru in the 1970s. The problem is that, at exactly the same time, elsewhere in Latin America, country after country was taken over by military regimes that shared few of these ideals of redistributive justice, though they did promise to bring order and progress by violence, if they felt the need. In Brazil, a coup d'etat had brought the military to power in 1964. In 1973, there were coups in Uruguay and in Chile. In 1976, the armed forces seized power in Argentina. In all these countries, and elsewhere, Paraguay, for instance, and much of Central America, anti-democratic regimes were run by soldier administrators, as Pantoja describes himself. For Pantoja, a soldier administrator is every bit as important as an artilleryman or infantryman. You laugh, he tells an old friend. But I guarantee you that someday you'll be surprised. We'll function throughout the country with a flotilla of boats, buses, and hundreds of specialists. Beyond Peru, however, such clandestine units of special forces were indeed fanning through the countryside, as well as patrolling cities such as Buenos Aires and San Salvador, Santiago de Chile, and Guatemala City. They sometimes used civilian clothes or vehicles, such as the feared Ford Falcons of the Argentine death squads, and official responsibility for the chaos they left behind was repeatedly denied. 
at least 5,000 people died without the basic protections of legal due process in the dirty war in Chile, 30,000 in Argentina, and tens of thousands more in Guatemala, El Salvador, Mexico, and elsewhere. Peru, too, would descend into a similar, if once again somewhat sui generis, bloodshed in the 1980s, with the war against the Maoist Sendero Luminoso insurgency marred by atrocities on both sides. For many observers, especially in the early 1980s, Sendero seemed like a millenarian death cult, whose violence was without rhyme or reason. One of the group's first public actions was to hang dead dogs from lampposts in Lima. In this context, what does it mean to depict clandestine military operations as a matter of fun rather than fear? To feature a comic hero whose defense for the chaos he has caused is the fact that he was only following orders. I organized this at the orders of my superiors. I need to have bosses. If I didn't, I wouldn't know what to do. It is not that dictatorship and comedy cannot or should not mix. There's a long tradition of black humor as a means of survival and even resistance under intolerable conditions. But in Captain Pantoja, Vargas Llosa's humor is hardly black, even when one of the central characters dies, in part as a result of Pantoja's enterprise getting out of control. In the novel, these are unintended consequences, no doubt. And there's no implication that Vargas Llosa is or was sympathetic to the dictatorships that gripped the region in the 1970s and 1980s, or the other forms of authoritarianism that lingered on thereafter. But nor is it clear that his humor offers resources for thinking about, let alone confronting, the violence waiting in the wings as he wrote his novel. Perhaps the real issue is not what went wrong in the past, but the dangers that still lie ahead.